would seem silly to us may be trickier to quantify than uh, it is to just, uh, I guess, qualitatively say that they look silly because there are images that are gestalt images that trick us and maybe the, uh, the, the I guess, duck rabbit images would look like a silly mistake if we didn't have, I guess, some of the bias of uh, knowing, I mean, there, there are a lot of, so yeah, what's, what makes it that the mistakes that these machines are making look a lot more silly than the mistakes that we can make when we see some of these gestalt images? Yeah, I mean, we bring decades of experience to interpreting our images, right? A, a newborn doesn't do that. Um, I think, uh, but yeah, we, we are vulnerable to all sorts of optical illusions. I meant to put a few in, actually. You can really play with your visual system and make something that's not moving at all, make you sure it's moving. I like that kind of thing, because you're, you're activating your convolutional filters in your brain for motion, even though nothing's moving. Um, so our brains are vulnerable to all kinds of tricks, too. It's just this is a different. This is optical illusions for neural nets. You know, it's just a different. And it could be that the optical illusions that we're familiar with, we just don't think that their like, our errors are that bad. But if there's some sort of if there's some metric of how bad they are, we could find that versus yeah. that's a even worse. I, I still think we're doing things in a very different way than than these machine learning models are, and in fact. We're doing it in multiple ways that kind of reinforce and check each other. I've certainly had the experience of looking at something and for the first half of a second I say, that must be a whatever, and I say, no, that's silly, that couldn't possibly be there. And then I look again and, you know, construct a more reasonable hypothesis. Um, and so we have this, this job running in the background that's constantly checking and making sure that, you know, the thing we just thought we saw is not ridiculous. Um, so, be good if they had that. Endless. <laughs> it, it's sobering to me that, you know, as we try to analogize to our own way of processing images, that we have to remember that, you know, forget our brain power, but a bird, you know, with a brain the size of a pea, right, can, can coast, yeah. you know, in, in the thermals and detect yeah. a, a prey against a cluttered forest floor. Yep. and dive down and grab it. And so there's some, some element of efficiency in the brain structure that uh, somehow circumvents a lot of this mathematics. Uh, and so our attempt to reproduce what our brains are doing, I think it's a much more daunting task than we realize. Yeah, I think so. And I, I think that shouldn't be the bar. Sometimes people say, well, you know, we need to make these like our brain before we can use them or something, but I think you can make a useful tool that you trust without understanding the human brain. If the bar is to understand the human brain before we can do anything, <laughs> I think progress will be slow. <laughs> okay, maybe the last question you. Yeah, I just I just want to raise, uh, ask you a question because I haven't heard this before, but I wanted to ask you about um, sort of the choice of bases here. I mean, a lot of the talk focused on you want to make these images with us, talking about image space modeling, but when we talk about image space often the choice of basis functions is really crucial. Shapelets, wavelets, and other sort of sparse approaches are much better than just sort of trying to draw random lines. And a lot of these neural nets are essentially doing versions of this, where you're just drawing lines everywhere and pooling things everywhere. And I know that there's some literature on trying to, say, construct neural nets on surfaces of spheres or rings. But from what you've seen, do you feel like that's a, a, an optimistic way forward? That we should be thinking about neural nets that focus on classifying certain So I know that some people have looked into, you know, fixing the convolutional layers, the first few layers, to be things that will give you like a wavelet basis or something. Um, and it doesn't seem to work better. The, the basis that they learn by trial and error seems to be as good as anything that humans impose on it. That, that may not be true. See, the thing is, if we're recognizing cats and dogs and horses, you know, we don't have a generative parametric model for a horse. I mean, there's not, there's not a simple way to write that down. When we're doing science, if we do have some a priori understanding of the kinds of things we're looking at, like I was talking to Jun Yin yesterday uh, about uh, looking at donuts from LSST and determining the, the Zernike parameters and so on, and, and what the, uh, you know, how to move the telescope elements to make the donuts look right. 
you can use machine learning on that. And in a case like that, you, you have a strong prior expectation of what you're going to see in the image. And you might know that certain filters are going to be good to start with. On the other hand, the neural net's going to figure that out fast. So I'm not sure it actually helps to give it a hint. I don't know. It's a try. Great. Thank you so much. Next time. Thank you. And nobody asked about the cool back library that much. So we have a seat two rooms left for tonight dinner. If anybody is interested, please message me. Two rooms left yeah. for dinner tonight. Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> oh you already registered. Oh, no. so, yeah. I mean, even the same with email. They agree to spend a half hour on email. I think this is a, a powerful concept. This loss function that we're talking about, or the, uh, the way they usually have most of the classifications out of the classifier, which is called softmax function. Um, it's actually just a constant plus the KL divergence between two distributions. One of the distributions is the one parameterized by the neural net, and the other is the one that generated the training data. So you can think of your training data, think of your set of images of cats as fair draws from the distribution of all possible candidates. That distribution. Right, and by minimizing this KL divergence, you are literally forcing one distribution to be the same as the other. And so there's a good mathematical, statistical, information theoretical basis for all this that is often ignored. Because people say, oh, well, we, we just do things and it kind of works and we're happy. But I think this can all be made for us. So I'm not. I'm looking for a place to do it. Um, but I, you know, wanting to be thorough and rigorous. I wanted to understand all the things that can go wrong. Yeah, I mean, the songs who came up with this. That a lot of people make, for example, if you take Kepler right first. That's correct. Was you a Kepler first? Yeah. Kepler binaries and magnets and whatsoever. I guess so, yeah. Try to classify anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, I forgot actually what you're working on. Do you remember what I worked on? You train on the box. That's a very important thing. Yeah, so noise and the points are in function. Oh, good. Yeah, now it is. Yeah, good. I was like, it was yeah. 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 yeah, I like to yeah. you you How about you? You are observer or you are I'm very tall. I'm very So, if you take that well, you know, if and then try to use it, that's a train If you take ground based light curves, train the network on that, and then try to classify any ground-based or space-based like that. And the second trick is don't force the classifier to classify. Always have a Mr. Lemons. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> None of the above because should always be an option. In, that is yeah. the most interesting bucket at the end because. Yeah. A lot of that is really noise and overexposed images that goes there, but they are easy to filter out. Mm -hmm. But those interesting cases you are interested in is not the, the textbook eclipsing binaries. Mm -hmm. It's the, the stuff where something new is going on. And something new cannot oh, be classified by a classifier because he has never seen oh, it. Material, so the so this, this Mr. Lenin's bucket is very, oh, very important. Yeah, yeah. Right. I think... Um, so how do you do that in practice? Do you have... So do you have um, a, a lot of... Are you, are you, you need? just um, yeah. changing the... Uh, you know, if you're outputting to a serious softmax function, you can modify it by hand to kind of say if none of also, the so activations going into it are high enough. Is there no, you just... You just oh, yeah, so I mean, there are tons of light curves of things out there which are um, not really classifiable. Because 
that have big gaps for growth. So you include those in your yes. training data with yes. a none of the above? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, you right, so the, the thing with that though is there's there's just a huge dimensional space of such things. And um, so you still have a chance of missing what you want, I think. But if you yeah, do the DK and N type thing, then you... Be aware of playing the statistics game here. So yeah. there is no 100% at the end. But I mean, the, the reason that something like DK and N work, should work better than that is it's really asking, is the result supported by the training data? And so as you wander away from anything that looks like the training data, yeah, it'll tell you that. Yeah, that uh, means you need to your training uh, data as broad as possible. Talking about the hiring process is that kind of doesn't exclude that you can, that you can construct hiring, really yeah, devious and behavioral fooling images, mm -hmm. but it makes it less likely that you are getting fooled by laws. Can I throw in a quick question? Yeah. I'm, I'm totally, because this looks like a longer discussion. Uh, I'm totally new to this stuff. Uh, is there a, a website or a book or something that you would recommend as a as a primer into it? And I have a feeling that actually yeah. the best way to learn it is use one of the, the yeah. programs, okay. uh, uh, put it on your computer, and actually do stuff. You know. And yeah, there are tutorials on the web for how to you know install various things on your computer and then try some uh, toy examples. But I think a good place to start actually is. Um, if you Google for Goodfellow and Deep Learning book, um, so Ian Goodfellow is one of the authors of the Deep Learning book, and the, the website is deepleadingbook.org, I think. Okay. Um, and that's that's a, a very nice book actually because it goes through not not just deep neural nets but many techniques of machine learning, uh, but then it focuses.